Hello and welcome to another complete Cambridge IGCSE PE lesson. In this video, we'll break down and simplify 11 recent past exam questions on Chapter 4, Energy Supply and the Effects of Exercise on the Body. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing to the channel, give the video a thumbs up and visit my channel page for short summary videos and my resource store by clicking the link in the description for complete revision and teaching materials. Let's begin, and question number one is on topic 4.1. As always, you can head down to the description of this video and find links to short summary videos containing literally everything you need to know on chapter four. So if you don't understand a question, head down, watch the relevant summary video, then come back and attempt it. So name and describe the main type of respiration being used to release energy for a sprinter and a long distance runner. So quite a simple question, this one. All we really need to do is name the main type of respiration being used by each athlete and then describe each of those two types of respiration as well. So a sprinter relies predominantly on anaerobic respiration, and then we need to describe that type of respiration. So anaerobic respiration, what happens there? Glucose is used to produce energy without oxygen, and lactic acid is released as a byproduct. Let's have a quick look at the mark scheme here. And uh, for the sprinter, it's anaerobic. You're going to get one mark for correctly naming the type of respiration. So one mark already for saying anaerobic respiration. And then our description of uh, anaerobic respiration, we could have just put the equation. So glucose gets converted into lactic acid there. Or you could have put it into words as I did. So glucose is broken down without oxygen and produces lactic acid. OK, so those are the main components of that process of anaerobic respiration. A really simple um, explanation there. And then for the long distance runner, we've got aerobic respiration, where glucose and oxygen are used to produce energy, carbon dioxide, and water. And of course, another way of describing that would be to write the equation. So glucose plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide and water. And of course, energy as well, which isn't mentioned here in the mark scheme. Mark scheme but that, that is the, uh, the main product of respiration that we're actually looking for there. OK, question number two, topic 4.3 this time. State, and this is a really simple command word we've talked about in our previous videos on chapter one to three. State simply means you need to name essentially two short term effects of exercise on a performer. So a really easy two marks here. Um, what could we have gone for? I went for a rise in body temperature. That is a short term effect of exercise. When you start to exercise, your body temperature increases. Uh, one, because we're producing more energy. So metabolism produces heat, but also our muscles themselves uh, produce heat as they contract. And then the second short term effect of exercise, I went for an increase in heart rate. And I added some additional detail here that wasn't actually necessary, but also not just heart rate that goes up, but also stroke volume, which is the amount of blood we eject from the heart per beat and cardiac output as well. So let's have a look at our options. You can pause this mark scheme um, to have a closer look if, you, uh, if you'd like, but heart rate increases for one mark. Adrenaline is produced and released into the blood. That's one of the things that causes our heart rate to increase during exercise. Breathing rate increases as well, so more oxygen entering the lungs, you could have said. Your body temperature goes up, we sweat, blood vessels closer to the skin become enlarged to release heat. Um, that causes our skin to turn red, we feel tired or fatigued, we might suffer from nausea or feeling unwell. More carbon dioxide is produced, lactic acid is produced, so there's a big long list here. And of course, I would have got a mark for saying increase in stroke volume and an increase in cardiac output, so this one is worth three marks here in fact, so an increase in heart rate would have been sufficient. So let's move on. The next question again, topic 4.3, suggest two short term effects of exercise on the performer. And you might be thinking, we've just answered this question and we actually have. So this is essentially a repeat of the previous question. The previous question said state two short term effects of exercise. And now this says suggest two short term effects of exercise. And essentially, it is exactly the same question. Remember, I'm going to run through every question that comes up in past exam papers with you. That's why we have repeats here. And this was the very next question on paper two of the May, June 2019 series, the previous one there on paper one. So the very next paper that came out, the same question came up. And it's really important to realize that clearly this is a, an, 
an important piece of information to remember all of the short-term effects of exercise. They do like to answer questions on this or ask questions on this. So breathing rate increases I went for this time, allowing more oxygen to enter the bloodstream. Always a good idea to add that little bit of extra explanation if you have the time just to guarantee the mark that you're, you're attempting to, uh, to, to get. The second point, the performer may sweat to control body temperature. Again, I've provided a bit of an explanation there by mentioning body temperature. But those um, explanations weren't actually required for the mark, so let's pause the video here again. It's the same mark scheme as before, so uh, no need to spend any time analysing that one. Okay, next question on topic 4.2. Explain how three factors affect a performer's recovery time after exercise. So let's go straight on to the answer here. There were a number of factors that you need to remember, the factors that affect our recovery time. And we'll have a look at those in the mark scheme in a moment. But the three that I've gone for are age. And uh, we needed to explain here, so it's not good enough just to state three factors that affect recovery time. You have to explain their impact on recovery time just a little bit. So age, how does that impact, impact recovery time? Well, recovery time tends to increase with age. So as we get older, we tend to take longer to recover. Pardon me. Number two, level of aerobic fitness. So obviously, quite obviously, fitter performers or people who have better levels of aerobic fitness, so improved uh, cardiovascular endurance, for example, they tend to recover faster as well. And that's partly due to the fact that they're better at delivering oxygen um, to their body's tissues and therefore removing um, lactic acid, etc. after exercise. Number three here, exercise intensity. And this one, another really obvious point, the harder we work, the greater the intensity achieved during exercise, the longer it's going to take us to recover when we finish exercising. So what about those factors that we need to know about? Really, really important um, section, this. Age was one. Sleep was another. So sleep quality. Take a look at that if you uh, didn't identify that one. We've also got the quality of equipment, such as running shoes. Um, so if we're using inappropriate running shoes, for example, we might create a little bit more damage to the joints and the connective tissues, maybe even the muscles, and that would lead to a longer recovery period. We've got overtraining there as well. So if a performer has been overtraining, they will tire more quickly. Um, we've got genetics. So some people naturally take longer to recover than others due to the genetic information that gets passed down from their parents. We've got environment here as well, diet, hydration, use of a cool down, lifestyle, level of fitness we talked about. And then right at the bottom, their general health or body weight. So poor health or being overweight tends to increase your recovery time. So take a little bit of time with that mark scheme if you need to. But we'll move on now. Topic 4.1, an equation for aerobic respiration is shown. So I mentioned earlier, we need to know the equations for the two types of respiration. Name the substances represented by A and B. So what are these two substances? Again, if we've learned our equations, there should be no problem whatsoever. We know for aerobic respiration, which involves oxygen, glucose and oxygen combine, um, go through a series of chemical processes, and we produce energy, of course, but our two waste products are water and carbon dioxide. So B is carbon dioxide there, and the mark scheme will just confirm that for us. Okay, next question. Also on 4.1, describe how and where glucose is, is stored in the body. So we've talked about glucose already as the fuel source for aerobic and anaerobic respiration. But where is glucose stored in the body? This question could have come up in diet and nutrition, a topic that we'll cover a little bit later on in the exam series. But it's also relevant for chapter four as well. So the question, sorry, the answer, glucose is stored as glycogen in the muscle tissue and liver. So when we have excess glucose, that simple sugar um, that we use to produce energy, when we have extra glucose, we store it as a different molecule called glycogen, which can be stored either in the muscle tissue and the liver as well. So those are the two parts of the question for two marks how and where. So how is glucose stored? Well, it's stored as glycogen. And where is it stored? Muscle and liver. And the mark scheme just clarifies that there. Okay, next question, also on 4.1. Describe using two physical activities, different situations where a performer is likely to change from using aerobic respiration to using anaerobic respiration. So two examples where someone goes from using aerobic respiration 
to using anaerobic. So what is it about aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration that we need to take into account? Well, essentially it's the intensity of the exercise being performed. If something is low intensity, then we're able to meet the energy demands using aerobic respiration um, on its own, essentially, or at least mostly aerobic respiration. But when the intensity increases, aerobic respiration can no longer meet the energy demands. So anaerobic respiration needs to come in and lend a hand to produce some of that additional energy. So we're looking at changing pace or intensity here. So my first example, a long distance cyclist uses mostly aerobic respiration on flat sections, but changes to an anaerobic energy supply during a hill climb. Number two, a netball player jogs to find space, so that's quite low intensity, so that's mostly aerobic, but then jumps explosively to retrieve a high pass. So that fast burst of high intensity activity is going to rely on anaerobic respiration. So any example really where we're changing from a low intensity to a high intensity period. And if we have a look at the mark scheme here, we can have a look at some additional examples as well. So in track and field athletics, in a distance race, an athlete will be running at a steady pace using aerobic respiration, but they might sprint in the final stages. So a sprint finish would use anaerobic respiration. So a really good example there. Um, in football, we've got a player moves into the opposition penalty area as the ball is crossed. That's quite a slow motion, so it's going to be aerobic, uh, sorry, aerobic respiration. But then they're going to jump to head to the ball, um, which would be an all-out effort, um, which would be anaerobic respiration. So you get the idea. Any example that demonstrates that change in pace. Okay, this one, a really simple question. You are quite likely to get a question that requires you to analyze a little bit of information on a graph. These tend to come up quite often. The graph shows the heart rate of a performer before, during and after an intense exercise session. Calculate the difference between the heart rate at zero seconds and the highest heart rate shown on the graph. So the difference between the heart rate when we start at zero seconds, just down here, and the highest point on the graph. So. What is the heart rate at zero seconds? Well, we can see here that the scale is taking us from 60 to 80. And if we count the boxes there between 60 and 80, there are five different boxes, which means each little square or box is worth four. Okay, four beats per minute. So that starting there is 64 beats per minute. You just want to take your time to make sure of these uh, that you're correct when you when you do this and when you, you look through a scale. And then at the top here, we're exactly halfway between 120 and 140 on the scale, so that's 130. So what do we need to do? We need to deduct 64 from 130. So 130 minus 64 gives us 66 BPM. So make sure you include BPM as well. We always want to include the units, and BPM stands for beats per minute, uh, which is our unit for heart rate. Okay, next question on the same graph, so calculate the duration of the exercise. Duration means how long does it go on for? So here is our exercise period, you can see between these two dotted lines. So we're going from 40, again we've got to check the scale, so each box here is also worth 4, so 4 seconds, so 44 seconds up to 84 seconds, which gives us a time of 40 seconds, that's the duration. So a really simple question, but take your time on these and make sure you're correct in terms of uh, working out the scale. All right, next question. Describe how excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, otherwise known as EPOC, aids recovery after exercise. Okay, this one's worth three marks. So after exercise, both heart rate and breathing rate remain elevated for some time. This speeds up the removal of carbon dioxide and produces the oxygen needed to break down lactic acid. Okay, have I made three points here? Let's see where my marks are coming from. So I'm suggesting here that I've actually made four points. The orange tick here is an unnecessary piece of information because I'd already got the marks from the previous three. So, describe how EPOC aids recovery after exercise. After exercise, both heart rate and breathing rate remain elevated for some time. That means they don't go back to resting levels straight away. It takes some time for our heart rate and breathing rate to come down. It happens gradually and that's really important. And if we look at the mark scheme, look here it says the heart rate stays high or reduces gradually. That's one mark. 
and also we have we mentioned breathing rate as well that was this first point here so oxygen or breathing rate stays high or reduces gradually and uh, that means that the body is taking in more air and oxygen uh, than it would be if we were just at resting levels okay so actually two marks for saying that heart rate and breathing rate remain elevated this speeds up the removal of carbon dioxide okay so removes carbon dioxide was another point we could have included so i've already got all three marks there and provides the oxygen needed to break down lactic acid so removes lactic acid was also a possible mark take a look through the mark scheme if you want to uh, see some alternative points you could have included there as well okay next question topic 4.4 describe the long-term effects of regular exercise on the heart so we attempted this one for chapter 3 on the circulatory system already there's a bit of a crossover as to whether this question fits into uh, the chapter on the circulatory system or on um, the effects of exercise the long-term effects of exercise um, so it's relevant for both well, the heart becomes larger as a result of regular exercise. So that's one of the main effects of exercising or training over long periods of time. Your heart's going to become larger and will gain a mark for that point. That leads to an increase in stroke volume, which is the amount of blood being ejected from the heart every time it beats or contracts. So, of course, if the heart is larger, when it contracts, it's going to be forcing more blood out. So that's an increase in stroke volume and an increase in cardiac output as well which uh, often goes up as a result of an increase in stroke volume. Okay, what could we have gone for? We could have said the heart size increases, which I put down there. Uh, another word for that is hypertrophy, which is the increase in the, the mass of the muscle of the heart, the myocardia, so we get thicker walls there. We could say that our resting pulse rate or resting heart rate reduces, and that's called bradycardia, a resting heart rate below 60 beats per minute. Stroke volume goes up, cardiac output goes up, we talked about here. Um, the, it re sorry, the heart returns to a resting heart rate more quickly when we recover. Okay, So if we exercise or train over long periods of time, the heart rate recovers more quickly when we finish exercising. So we get better at recovering. And uh, the heart, because it's bigger and stronger, it can produce stronger contractions. And also we have a reduction in the risk of heart disease as well if we exercise over long periods of time. And that was the last question on the topic. So we're all finished up there. Uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment down below if you have any suggestions for how these videos could be improved. As always, I hope you found this lesson useful and I'll see you next time for 11 questions on Chapter 5, Simple Biomechanics.